Uh, excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome, salam, peace to all of you. Um, I have a friend um, uh, who used to work with me at CNN. She was on the CNN and Espanol side, and we reconnected after 20 years. Um, she lives in Spain, and somehow, whenever I was with her, she'd constantly be saying things like, Oi, Dios, Dios mío, oh God, you know, my God. And I have Muslim friends who often, when something happens, they say, Ya Allah. And Indian Hindu friends, Bhagwan. We all seem to sort of call out to God, <laughs> you know, at, at all times. And I know there's that expression, thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. But somehow we keep turning to God um, sometimes when things don't go right. Uh, and we seem to do it all the time. The funny thing is, uh, we seem to do it irrespective of religion. So with our wonderful, diverse, and accomplished panel today, we're going to have a rather interesting discussion and debate on what constitutes faith in the modern world. And we'll look at... Basically, tomorrow, as we look at tomorrow, try to define the role faith might play in the lives of future generations. Now, as you're all educated people, and uh, I know you all know why you're, why you're here, so you, I'm sure, have read up on all the guests. I'm not going to do long biographies, but just a quick brief introduction. Uh, perhaps ladies first. I'll start with uh, Leslie Hazelton, who's an award-winning journalist, historian, blogger, and author of a number of books. One particularly interesting one being The First Muslim. A look at Islam through the, the eyes of the Prophet Muhammad and how Muslim, uh, the Muslim holy book, the Quran, was revealed to him. Uh, Gelong Thubten is next to her, to the right, and uh, he's a Buddhist monk. Gelong is actually a, a title meaning senior monk, um, preceding his name Thubten. He's a best-selling author of A Monk's Guide to Happiness, as well as teaching meditation. He specializes in providing non-religious mindfulness training. Uh, Omar Saif Gobash is, I would say, first and foremost, a father. Uh, it was that most important role that prompted him, <laughs> prompted him to communicate with his sons about the importance of understanding the true message of Islam. Uh, and he wrote it in an inspiring book called Letters to a Young Muslim. Oh, and in case I didn't mention it also, by the way, he serves this country as the uh, UAE's Assistant Minister for Cultural Affairs, having held the post of ambassador to France and to Moscow. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, I, I try to make the sessions as interactive as possible because I get to spend a lot of time with the authors in the green room and off, offline, asking questions and chatting with them. So I always like to think you've taken the trouble to come to the festival, and this is your chance to connect directly with these key guests that we bring in from around the world. So I like to think of this as a Q&A session from the beginning. Uh, I'm going to kick off with a question to each person, but what I'll do is say after that, really, it's, it's a free-for-all for you to ask your questions. So put your hands up clearly, and I will get the microphone to you, I promise the best I can in the order that the hands go up. But I'm going to start ask, you, ask a question to each of the guests as we look at faith in the modern world. And perhaps, Leslie, I could start with you. Oh, no, you probably wouldn't. No. No? That's not fair. I can, I can shift, but, <laughs> but now you're awake. I have to. <laughs> I, I, guess right, one I keep of the on things... doing this because I can't <laughs> see from here. Is there any way we can turn the lights down? Uh, maybe stay, you can dim but... the lights a bit on Thank stage. You. There we go. Thank Is that better? You. No. I thought we were trying to recreate Abu Ghraib. We're now, we're now, mood, <laughs> <laughs> we're now all in uh, mood, mood lighting. Uh, uh, really, I guess the thing that, that I found I'm trying fascinating... trying to avoid the question. <laughs> the thing I found fascinating in researching and, and, and reading about what you've done was you've explored religions and faiths across really. a number of things. But, but the thing that I, I was curious, and I guess because many people in this part of the world, of course, we have a, you know, this is a, essentially a Muslim country, so though it's very diverse and multicultural and secular, I wonder what lessons you learned when you were starting to look at the life of the Prophet and the origins of the Quran. Ah. Uh, I was really sorry, Riz, but I, I, I don't write in order to learn lessons. Okay. I write in order to explore. And when I wrote about Muhammad, and I call him Muhammad and not the Prophet Muhammad and not PBUH, peace be upon him, and so on, because um, I think that's false. I think that's false coming from a non-Muslim. So I should state ahead of time, I am a resolutely agnostic Jew. Uh, so my interest in him was not really religious. It was fascination with this person <laughs> who was, I, I mean, I know this sounds like heresy to a believing Muslim, but I wanted to know who he was. To me, everything starts with the simplest possible question. Who was this man? Who was he really? Can I try and get, and I know how this sounds, but forgive me if it insults you, can I try and get inside his mind? Can I 
try and understand, put myself in his shoes, and understand not only him, but his whole milieu, where he was, what influences were on him, and so on. And taking nothing for granted. Um, I mean, just to take one small example, for instance, everything I'd read about him just mentions, you know, well, his father died before he was born, and blah, 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 blah. blah. I'm thinking, wait a moment, in seventh century Arabia, what does that mean, to be born without a father? And how come his mother didn't marry, and remarry instantly? How come she didn't marry one of his brothers, as would have happened at that time, normally? What was happening here? What was happening in this society? What was happening with the Quraysh in Mecca? The, something was happening, something was wrong, something was disintegrating. And that led me to a whole understanding of both the politics and the economics, which all, of course, and the culture, all of those intertwined of the time. So I'm looking not only at the man, but also at everything that feeds into the making of the man and trying to accord him what I consider the most basic respect, and that is the integrity of a full life lived. Um, so my reasons were not in any way religious. I don't, people say, well, you've written books about Islam. I don't think I have. Um, I wrote a biography of Muhammad to the best of my ability, which is not, because I was so disappointed in the biographies that I'd already read, because they were either academic or, again, forgive me if this insults you, or written from a, a surplus of piety, uh, too reverent. Uh, and I understand how much he is loved and how much he is revered among believing Muslims, but it wouldn't help any if I wrote a book that would satisfy that impulse. Uh, it certainly wouldn't help me, it wouldn't satisfy me. I wanted to understand the man. Um, um, thanks, Leslie. I'm going to bring in uh, Ambassador Gorbash here because you, uh, in a way, have also looked at Islam, in this case, uh, in a way to, to explore it uh, with, your, with your child, with your son, your eldest son at the time when you wrote uh, a letter to young Muslims. So uh, I wonder what your, your, how your perspective uh, changed or came about, to, you know, how you expressed it, if you like, to your son, and what message you were trying to get across. So I referred to the book, The First Muslim, as uh, The Last Muslim, by accident. Uh, and I think because, I, in my mind, the way things, are, things have moved um, in our... Sorry, Ambassador, I'm going to ask, can, can anyone hear at the back? Can everyone hear? You can. Otherwise, okay, I think come closer. <laughs> Mariah's going to give you a mic. So. Great, thank you. Hello. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the, the point was, in, in the, at the back of my mind, uh, I have um, a kind of a pessimistic view of where things are going. Uh, and what I was trying to explain to my uh, older son uh, was that there are all these incredible forces uh, acting upon uh, the religion of Islam, and perhaps on other religions as well, and so that it no longer becomes clear what is the right course uh, to choose. And actually, you need to be very self-conscious about the forces that are acting upon you before you even come to the text. Gelong Thupten, this is the interesting thing. You actually uh, have found a particular path uh, through Buddhism, and you also uh, take care to teach people, irrespective of religion, mm. and what it means to be mindful, how to meditate, and so on. What's interesting is how you came to take the path you did. So just give us a, a, just a, a recap of how you ended up there. Well, I, I ended up as a Buddhist monk because I, I got very burned out from stress, and I, I was looking for something that would help me put my head back together. I was suffering a lot. And the thing that drew me to Buddhism, because I've never really been interested in religion, but what drew me to Buddhism was that technically, I suppose it is a religion, but it's, it, it's very, uh, well, you're told to doubt and question all the time. One of the most famous teachings of the Buddha was don't believe a word I say. <laughs> so. And in fact, the word Buddhism is something obviously invented very recently. The, the, the original terminology translates as the science of awareness. So that's what drew me in, was the, the idea that I could start to work with my own mind, work with my thoughts and emotions. And so now when I teach, I, I teach anybody who wants to learn to work with their thoughts. It, it's, a, it's a very scientific process, and it's regardless of what you believe or don't believe. So people from all religions or no religion will be very drawn to meditation because it's so uh, democratic. 
the dichotomy, if I, if I see it correctly, is that Buddhism encourages one to look within. Mm. And ironically, you're having to go out mm. to get people to look within. Mm. <laughs> and these are people looking out, <laughs> and you're trying to get them. How difficult is it to persuade people that it's not a religious doctrine, that you're really trying to take them through a mental process mm. that irrespective of religion or faith? Well, possibly that's why the word mindfulness is used now more popularly than meditation, because maybe the word meditation did make people think it has to be a, a Buddhist exercise or something connected with Eastern philosophy. And now the word mindfulness is used uh, more, pop uh, uh, more regularly because I think it has that neutral tone to it, that it's just about the mind. Um, to me, there's no difference. I mean, it, some people make a very big difference between meditation and then what they call secular mindfulness. I don't really understand that, because if you get two people sitting next to each other meditating, and one's doing meditation, the other one's doing mindfulness, is the meditator observing their breath in a religious fashion, and the other one not? I don't think so, it's just training the mind. So you have to use words in different ways to get people to understand it, but the practice is the same regardless. Thank you. So, excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to ask you to put your hands up. I saw one going up already there, so, uh, Mariah, maybe you could uh, offer the microphone to the young lady there. Hello, uh, my name is Dubai. I'm an author here at the festival, and my question today has to do with your view on um, how faith is being disrupted and will continue to be disrupted by technology in the age of social media. And I say this because historically, religious texts across different faiths have been hijacked by religious scholars, and I say religious scholars in parentheses. Mm -hmm. um, they've been hijacked by scholars that really gotten their influence by positioning themselves are, as being the only uh, ones who know what God wants from us and want us to do. So one could make it an argument um, that Google, too, right now, uh, can be regarded as the all-knowing and all-seeing <laughs> source as well. So how, how do we reconcile these contradictions? And can Very soon they will know you actually said that too, and it'll be, <laughs> that will never disappear. Um, Leslie, I'm going to ask you this, the disruptive nature of technology in, in, in how we see faith. Um, I think we're confusing an awful lot of things here. Uh, this belief, which is easy, by the way. <laughs> this faith, which is very difficult, Kierkegaard talked about the leap to faith, and, it's, and it really is a leap. You know that you're making it. And what do we mean by faith? I mean, this, you know, we've come to identify religion and faith, you know, oh, ye of many faiths, <laughs> sort of interfaith stuff, which is, kind of drives me a little bit crazy. You know, sort of interfaith is like, no, you Muslim, me Jew, we friends. It's like Tarzan and Jane. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 um, this, this is not a good basis for understanding for friendship, you know, just relate to each other as people, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, there you are, a little, <laughs> little bit of interfaith right there. But um, the God is involved. And I see, yeah, I wrote an agnostic manifesto, so this kind of, you know, I see God really as, it, it, it's too small a word, isn't it? It's just a three letter word. It's sort of like bringing everything that we don't understand, this magnificent, a concept that we've created the, down to human size. So it's got, got a nice pet, you know, three letter word and we can talk about him and his will and what he wants or she wants. And I was saying to Omar before, actually I've got the perfect use for the gender neutral pronoun. They, them, their, God, <laughs> right? Much better than him or her. Of course, or I, I it. thought it was a very, very bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes the people who are most ostentatiously believers are, in fact, those with the least, what I call the religious sensibility. Um, those who obey every single rule and every single law who seem to see religion as this sort of uh, a legalistic thing and what they miss out on is completely is the spirit behind it is the poetry I mean these texts the Quran and the Bible and all the other texts of all the great religions have lasted so long because they are poetry not because they're books of rules and books of law legal texts and so on and if we miss that if we miss out on the poetry behind it we are 
just taking the juice out of it all, we're just making it into this horrible, dry thing. And worse, it becomes inhuman. I mean, I'm thinking, uh, there's one scene that haunts me still. And I think it was at the time when Boko Haram in Nigeria had taken all those schoolgirls captive and made them into slaves, sex slaves and work slaves, both. Uh, and somehow or other, I, call, I don't usually watch news on TV because I can't stand what TV does to the news. But um, I caught this on TV and it was an interview with the self-appointed leader of Boko Haram. And my God, I don't know what that guy was on, but he was high on some one drug or another. His pupils were totally dilated. He was grinning like just mad. He thought he was just everything, the bee's knees. He was boasting about taking these girls captive and making them into slaves. And at the same time, he was waving around, um, what's the word for the, the, the toothpick that Muhammad used? Biswak. Biswak, yes, you know. He was waving it around and saying, see, I'm such a great Muslim. This is what Muhammad used, and I used the, the toothpick of exactly the same material. This is, and he was justifying, you know, taking these girls from the Quran and so on. And I'm, this man, this murderer, this massacre, this kidnapper, this rapist, who understood nothing at all of what he claims is his own holy book. So, you know, a lot of people can claim expertise. A lot of people can claim that they are, know the truth, that they are the best Muslim or the best Christian or the best Jew or the best Buddhist or the best Hindu. So we don't have to believe them. We don't have to accord them that status. It's up to us, you know. We can allow our religions or our faiths not that I have one, but as an agnostic, but we can allow faith or religion, whatever word you use, to be hijacked in the way that you were talking about. That is on us. It's not on them. They will continue doing that. They are demagogues and murderers and rapists. So if we, if we give them that authority, they will take it. It's up to us to stand up and say, no, this is not what it is to me as a Muslim, or as a Jew, or as a Christian, or as a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or an agnostic, or an atheist, or however you identify yourself. I want to get the ambassador's perspective on this, because of course technology, as Mitch has indicated, is a way to have reach. Yeah. Uh, and often, with organized religion, reach is an important thing, but also with debate and discussion and questioning and redefining, yeah. it's also a tool as well. What's your perspective? Uh, I was going to say, well, I, I, while we were sitting here, I realized that I'm actually at a disadvantage. And the disadvantage is that I actually, um, whether I like it or not, have to represent a religion. Uh, I don't have the freedom to say I can split, divide between spirituality and religion or faith and religion. I can't say I'm an agnostic Muslim. I wasn't uh, it, asking you as a Muslim, yeah. by the way. I was asking you. To... Uh, no, I know, but the audience <laughs> right. and the camera will show me that uh, and show everybody. So in, in a sense, it kind of restricts the kind of thinking that I can do even if I wanted to think outside the box. A, a, there, there is this idea that actually the, uh, um, in, you know, hundreds of years ago, religion covered all questions. Religion filled in all gaps. Religion was the universe. There was, you could have a metaphysical explanation that covered everything. Uh, the problem is that we're facing today is that it doesn't seem to cover all the, all the gaps anymore. And this is where, where if I'm going to think a little more freely, um, the way in which religion is presented, it's presented as, a, as a, almost a product. Uh, so the capitalist machine works on, on marketing things, and our um, power-oriented religious clerics are also marketing. Uh, and I, I know that there's somebody in the audience here who, who has um, connections with people who are actually doing neuroscience um, uh, research onto the different parts of the brain that are provoked by certain kinds of narratives, which again makes me think, well, how, how do we talk about the truth within religion when, uh, and that's very much something that is, is a part of the dominant narrative in all kinds of conversations about Islam, this is the true path, that's the true path. I actually never said I was trying to explain the true path of Islam in my book. I was trying to explain perhaps how one might take a global approach to questions of religion. So in fact, the book isn't necessarily directed towards Muslims. It's anybody who wants to form a world view. Um, thank you. Uh, also, there's, there's, um, 
this whole idea of looking to religion for answers, actually looking to anyone for answers, mm. I mean, I think what you said was so important that, I mean, God, how many of you know someone who always has all the answers? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, talk about obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> or else it's that person who, you know, you're in a really, really interesting conversation over the dinner table and somebody starts wondering about something and that person whips out their cell phone and looks oh, yeah, it up yeah. on Google and gives you the answer and it's, everything just goes, uh, <laughs> right? You were having a great conversation before. Uh, it's the questions that are so fascinating and it's the questions that have no answers that are the most fascinating for me as an agnostic. These are questions that go to, I mean, these are truly existential questions to do with our existence, not only in this room and not only in this country and not only on this planet, but in what we think of as this universe, which is only one of untold billions of universes, this much we know. But we don't, you know, we know how, we don't even know how much we don't know. We talk about infinity, and, <laughs> and we use infinity. The basics of infinity, I mean, that's the basics of quantum mechanics. That's how your cell phones work, so even though we don't, we don't really understand quantum mechanics. You know, it's called weirdness. It's called the weirdness of infinity. I love this. I love that we are using stuff that we don't understand, and I love that we keep on questioning. It's when we have or we think or we imagine that we've found the answer, inevitably the, right, that, 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 that definite article, the right. answer, then so I think we get into real trouble. Then we, Leslie? we lose ourselves. We so lose I'm going to try and get more humanity. questions in because I'm we've sorry. gone down the quantum <laughs> physics path. <laughs> so. you did, it's, yeah, it's tough to shut me up. <laughs> no, no, it's not that. I just, <laughs> I, I just I wanted to make sure we had a few of the, the other questions because I promised there was a, there actually a second person who had their hand up. Uh, was it you? I know, I was after there was one here and then there was one over there. That's it. I remember you, so thank you. Thanks. I'll try and get you in the order they got. Please be patient. Um, with me. So, we've been hearing a lot that people are describing themselves as spiritual and not religious um, today. So, one of the cruxes of, of major religions is this concept of judgment and that you will be judged at some point, no matter what, you know, that's pervasive in all, all religions. So, do you think that's a concept that people are moving away from and that's why they're identifying as spiritual or are there any other factors of why people are turning more spiritual yeah. rather than, than religious? I'll, I'll ask in a second, but I want to get Gillam Cookton in here because again, you, you deal with people on the basis, irrespective of faith, on understanding. I, su I suppose I, I've noticed um, a dissatisfaction with organized religion because of politics, because of abuse issues. Um, so, so people are disgruntled with the, the, the organized norms and then are redefining themselves as spiritual rather than religious. So I think it's come from there. Uh, I do a lot of work in Ireland, and of course in Ireland there's been a lot of uh, a, a expose of abuse in the church, and so people now are, uh, still want something, but they want to take it away from an organized. So, so meditation is disorganized religion <laughs> be because it's just up to you to train your own mind. There's no central authority telling you what to do. So, so I'm noticing that trend. Hi, um, my name is Fatma Jassim. Uh, thank you for all for, uh, for the interesting conversation we're having today. I just have one question. Uh, in the past and precisely uh, nowadays, um, you know, religion is used uh, is always used as a card politically to cover things, and uh, I'm interested into uh, knowing your perspective of how can we as individuals uh, recognize when whenever religion is used uh, as a cover up, or um, or would it be um, or would it be uh, used as <laughs> For example, if the person is uh, religious nowadays, uh, would it uh, would it necessarily mean that he or she is uh, not pessimistic now uh, in the, our modern world or optimistic? Okay. Thank you, uh, um, Gillian Tipton. I'm going to put this to you for the simple reason I want to ask: 
and I'll come to you as well, uh, Ambassador. But I want to. Um, well, I was waving at. Oh, okay. Know each other. I just. I wonder if if this comes into some of the teachings you do um, uh, that you you put out that people have to start to recognise. Um, the difference between something that's politicized, something, you know, take them away from the path of following polit politicized religion just so they can uh, more honestly explore faith and, and goodness, as, as Mitch was describing. Where does that come into your teachings? Well, I try to help people um, look within and uh, understand their minds differently and uh, so, so to develop a deeper understanding of how their thoughts and emotions operate. And so through, through calming the mind, I think a natural kind of wisdom and intelligence and also compassion, as you were talking about, would naturally start to emerge. And then one's view of oneself and others will be uh, coming from a different place. So I'm just trying to help people to uh, get below the surface of their minds and see what's underneath that. And then you can make decisions from a purer place Ambassador, I wonder if, if there's a need in education systems mm. to help people understand better what they, they explore online, for example, or the information they get through news media, just to be a little more, more discerning. I mean, it doesn't just apply to faith or religion. It applies to a number of things, but it might also help misunderstandings about faith and religion. Can I avoid that question? You uh, can, if you like. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, you know, you're, you're asking government to start telling people what to do and what to read and what not to read. Yeah. That doesn't t tends not to work, especially with uh, virtual private networks. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. I was thinking uh, of it less as a government thing. I was thinking more as, as a kind of uh, in, in an educational format as yeah. opposed to a mandated format, just as a kind of awareness thing. Like, you Do you know. really think that works? I mean, curiosity is the thing that drives people. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, as, as soon as you tell me that it's probably best not to look at this, I, I'm going to go uh, and look at it. Yeah. Okay, I didn't mean it in the <laughs> don't look at it, yeah. but just to understand <laughs> what you look at. I'll give you a yeah. simple example. I was sure. at a, a seminar years ago, a journalist yeah. teaching about research online. Yeah. This is going back about 18 years, 19 years, mm -hmm. when people were only just starting to explore uh, search, search engines and so on. And he showed a website which was about Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, if you go onto this website and read it, and we started looking through it in this kind of small class, it was kind of talking about Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, so on. He did this, this, and this. And the text slowly started to go towards, but he was also known for this. And by the end, it was kind of portraying him negatively. Mm -hmm. And what the guy was telling us is that this is actually a right-wing Nazi, neo-Nazi group sure. that has written about, and it's, it's misinforming. Sure. And unless people actually understand that they have to even just be aware, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean to well, say don't look at it, but... You know that there's this big debate about the way the YouTube algorithm pushes you to more extreme uh, material. Um, that's, that's, so we, we need to understand the forces that are working on us. There are political forces, there are technological forces, and at the back of all of this is people making money off our, uh, out of our heads. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's absolutely important, but we need to actually unite to talk to the tech guys, the guys who are pretending that they're, you know, they're, they're doing this for, for a greater global community, when they're actually making money by making us more extreme. I also think it's very important to understand in the way, earlier you were talking about technology and uh, its, its effects on religion. I remember um, uh, about 15 years ago, I, uh, we, we had a guy who worked in, in the particular office of the nonprofit organization I was involved with. And it was the beginning of the uh, American uh, invasion, occupation, liberation of Iraq. Uh, choose the appropriate term. <laughs> and uh, and he, he was, a, thank you. <laughs> and what I found interesting was that he was a very um, devout Sunni Muslim Iraqi. And he told me that he collected suicide videos. Oh God. And I'm like, what are you doing to your mind? He said, no, you know, I like to, I like to collect them as, I, I collect as many as possible, and I keep them, and I, I watch them from time to time. I'm like, this is insanity. But in the same way, you know, when you were, when, when you, uh, in pre-internet times, you'd be able to listen to the Quran uh, only if you recited it yourself or if you got your tape recorder. Uh, a friend of mine had this great business idea uh, um, in, the, in the early 2000s that he was going to, have this uh, headset which played Quran all day in your ears. And I was like, that's, that's insane. The Quran is meant to be read on occasions, it's meant to be listened to on, on occasions, but don't absolutely immerse yourself in it because that's a complete distortion of any kind of understanding of religion. Not only that, it's just, it becomes background, it doesn't become a focus anymore. Yeah, no. but I mean, you know the point system. If you're in vaguely in touch with it, you're getting points, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Miss, miss Please, can I ask you. a question? Thank you. Thank you. It's a question I've, you have to forgive me. <laughs> because I've always wanted to ask this of a Buddhist monk. <laughs> I like the way you started by asking for forgiveness from a Buddhist monk. 
And it relates back to the question about uh, religion being hijacked by the extremists and so on. Uh, shouldn't we be angry? Shouldn't we be outraged? Shouldn't we be moved to action instead of being calm? Or is there such a thing as calm outrage or I calm? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, I know so many Muslims. I, I mean, it, it, for me as a Jew, you know, I, it, even though I'm not religious, you know, it still is part of my identity. It's, it's part of who I am. Um, it's part of the way I think and part of the way I identify. I identify with, we're all multiply hyphenated. You know, I can describe myself with you know, a dozen or two dozen or a hundred different uh, adjectives, but um, all hyphenated. But, uh, you know, when I look at what's happening with Israel and Palestine, when I look at what Israel is doing in the, in the, in the, in the West Bank and in Gaza, when I look at the, the, the latest thing, the annexation and so on, I mean, I am... I, I, Oh, when I look at, you know, what's happening in the United States right now, it, it is just, how do I accept this in any way calmly? And why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that there is a... <laughs> I think there is a, a perception that Buddhism, meditation, it sort of makes you calm and passive and removing anger. I think uh, that the, the driving force in, in meditation practice is compassion and trying to help others. And I don't think it makes you um, inactive and passive like a doormat. Uh, <laughs> but I think anger doesn't achieve as much change as compassion. Because when we're angry, we demonize the other. And then we're just angry. You ask me to not demonize Trump? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because I think if we, can, if we can understand the human condition and the suffering and ignorance that drives people to do what they do, then we can start to talk to them and influence them. If we just hate them, how can we influence them? And, and Leslie... Leslie, just in case uh, that wasn't sufficient to calm you, no. uh, monks, <laughs> monks, no, monks also sufficient. teach kung fu. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that young lady was waiting very patiently with the question. Okay, yes, um, I have a question that um, centers around internal conflict, and it's something that, for example, um, example in Islam. Um, we have a lot of people, um, even away from the demagogues and the people who are very extreme, just, I would say, normal, average people. <laughs> Um, who are very split on how how much do we want to change from where from where we were? Where, for example, um, issues like about women's rights or you know ethnic minorities or uh, any minority about, um, for example, with um, inheritance that it's um, there are people who still believe that it should be divided a certain way, where other people even now are um, want to divide it 50-50, for example. So uh, there's all these progressive issues happening. So how do we handle um, internal conflict where, away from the extremism, people are just split about, we need to move forward, we need to progress, we need to change certain things that were previously seen as like set in stone, and this is the truth, this is the way okay. it has to be. So, uh, Ambassador, I, watching the interviews you did, sorry, I've got to ask you this, because one of the things right. you said no, is I think your I son go, reached huh? an age, your elder son, <laughs> reached an age where he started to ask questions, and I think yeah. what the young lady is doing there is asking the same kind of thing. How do you... How do you guide people who have these kind of questions? Uh, I think uh, we're lucky that we live in a big world. It's not as small as you think. Uh, and some of the most interesting things that are going on in Islam are going on outside of the Arab and the Muslim world. Places like Denmark and the US and, and you know, sort of Western Europe in general. Uh, and I'm, I'm all in favor of more ideas. And so I'm always fascinated, for example, by uh, communities of homosexual Muslims. Uh, lesbians and gays, and I'm like, wait a second, I mean, you know, even if as a person I don't have an issue with, with that, for me, it, uh, theologically it doesn't make sense, and I would love to hear uh, the rational argument as to how that works. That argument is not something that we can develop in our part of the world. Yeah, we, you can't even start the subject, although it seems that I am already starting <laughs> the subject. <Yeah. laughs> these, these subtle messages, right? <laughs> 
Uh, but one, one place where the, 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 a certain very interesting argument has started is around the idea of tolerance. And we spent the entire of last year talking about uh, how we as the Emirates are uh, in the forefront of building tolerance, not just within Islam, but between Islam and other faiths. Uh, we're missing a part of what we should be doing, which is actually discussing what we mean by tolerance. And getting people who are generally good-natured good and friendly and, and you know, used to uh, uh, operating in multicultural societies uh, is one thing. But actually going out to the tough places and finding you know, those hardcore Roman Catholics who refuse to shake the hands of a Muslim, I'm sure there are some, yeah? uh, and putting them in front of, you know, sort of long beards out of, out of the Middle East uh, would be very, very interesting. So what I'm saying is that um, even if we don't necessarily have those arguments here, you'll find those arguments online. Another thing that's very interesting that you should look into is why is it that some of the leading thinkers in Islam are actually converts to Islam? Yeah? And it's because they have been brought up in an environment where there's much more freedom of expression and thought and ideas. And I'm talking specifically within a religious context. Yeah? So a lot of them, and you have, to, you have to read carefully and listen carefully to what they're saying, because in a sense they are, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of one guy in particular, he's almost Christianizing the, the discourse in Islam. And it comes to us as though, hey, this is from within our own tradition. But it's actually a very, very interesting and careful exploration of different aspects of our Islam. So, so you're thinking of Hamza? Yes. Hamza, I'll try to squeeze in as many answers, uh, questions as I can uh, in the time we have left. The young lady there, please. Um, I just wanted to thank the author, Leslie, because when I read her book, The First Muslim, um, it moved me so much because you made the prophet tangible to me. Hmm. I could relate to him. I could feel him. I could see him as a human being that I could connect. And I think there's these trends today where we have spirituality, we have energy courses that um, basically diluted the ancient traditions, marketed it, and commercialized it and made money off of it. Yeah. But when you come back, every all of that knowledge comes from all these beautiful ancient traditions. And we're always talking about what's wrong with religion, but I wish we would turn the conversation of what's right with religion, what's beautiful with religion, mm. if we could move it to that way. And there are some questions like, um, like you said, simple questions that we have to go inside and look into ourselves. So if I only think about the, like, the first verse of the Quran that was re revealed to the Prophet, I ask myself, why did God um, choose to reveal, read, the word read and creation and gener generosity together? I've looked for that question everywhere, but um, I wanted to see uh, what your advice would be in can that. I, can I just Thanks. Uh, I'm ask you to put do an introductory you, statement thank for you. Yeah. Leslie, I was going to ask you this. It, it, are Riz, we, Riz, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. We were speaking. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> sorry. I, I, I thought you were mumbling, so I thought, that, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was entitled can, to it. Can I just make one point uh, there? The, we keep talking about you know, um, what's wrong with religion. There is a, a kind of a, a, a battle going on between those who want a broader understanding and those who want to monopolize power and, and influence and money and who are making religion a business. And that's why, you, you know, to delegitimize them, to take away their authority, that's why we need to attack what they're doing, what they're saying. If we come along and say, actually, you know, everything is really great and, you know, these are the beautiful aspects without ignoring the corrosive elements who are thriving on, uh, on the current situation, then we, we, we're losing part of the battle. Does that mean that there is no scope to discuss the positive side then? No, there is scope to discuss that. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I'm just saying, I'm explaining why there still is very Some much a topic. focus on, on what's not going right. Understood. Uh, sir? You know, it's, it's, it's a strange way to think of religion. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's either good or bad, you know. Mm. Uh, is, you know, is Judaism good for the Jews? Is Islam good for the Muslims? I don't know. Is it a good religion or a bad religion? Oh, it's like that whole thing about, you know, is Islam a religion of peace or a religion of war? I mean, what a ridiculous, I'm sorry. It's just such a, a again, it's sort of bringing it down to sort of very, very, well, not the war and peace are small issues, but it's, it, it, it's um, trying to close it in, to enclose it, to sort of get, okay, this is nice and neat. This is what religion is. This is Muslim, you know, this is Islam, and this is Judaism, and this is, and everything's nicely sorted in, in its box. And the sensibility, the religious sensibility, that, that, that sense of mystery and awe and wonder, thank God, as it were, 
cannot be boxed. It, 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 it's larger than all that. And religions at their best, and when I say religions at their best, I don't mean religion as it is taught. I mean those who practice it, those who are religious, those who do have faith. It's, um, it's, it, it's from within them, it's from within you. Not this imam or that leader or that and so on and so on. Some may inspire you, some may not inspire you. Okay, you we've got, we're literally down to two minutes, so I'm going to ask the gentleman. We may not have time to answer your question, but at least you can ask it. <laughs> so my name is Hassan. So my question is, I mean, there appears to be a disconnect between religion uh, and faith, spirituality, belief, because it appears that religion, as we know, is text, is a set of rituals. But how do you transcend to spirituality, to faith, to belief? Because if you want to teach a child, you cannot teach them spirituality. I mean, we know that we teach them to do good. We teach them recycling, and we teach them to help others, and we teach them. But that, in a way, absolves them of their responsibility towards the greater good, because they think they have done their good for the day. So how do you connect? Because if you take religion completely out and expect somebody to become spiritual and have faith and belief, how does that happen? Because that happens through experiences, through living a life. Okay. And so, so. so that, that deep and mysterious question is going to be left hanging for everyone to discuss afterwards because I, I'm, fortunately I come from TV and we are, we're so strict on timekeeping. So forgive me, but please, a big warm round of applause for our uh, panelists. And again, a big thank you to uh, Dan on, on, on the audio there for us and our interpreter. Thank you. And uh, Mariah and the others in the team that are here. Emirates Airline, of course, uh, and uh, the, the foundation. And also, uh, do the writing was terrible. I didn't get the card. But Dubai Tourism and the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Knowledge Foundation. Thanks again for the support for this session. Thank you.